Good evening. Now, I don't know whether you're showing this in the afternoon, the evening, or early in the morning. It'd be really rough if it was early in the morning. I'm talking to you, sort of. At the moment, I feel as though I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to you while I look out the window across the Pacific, down the harbour, past the Tairua Heads, and across the Pacific. An ocean of peace, and long may it stay so. You asked me what prompted our government to appoint a minister for disarmament. Quite simply it was because in 1987, the fourth Labour government passed the New Zealand Nuclear Free Zone Disarmament and Arms Control Act. This act set out a nuclear free zone consisting of land, ocean, airspace. This act ensured that unless a ship declared it was not carrying nuclear weapons, it couldn't enter New Zealand waters. It resulted in the end of ANZUS, which was a mutual defence treaty between Australia, New Zealand and the United States. We stood alone in New Zealand, but we believed in the independence of our country and we also believed that we had a choice to live by our own foreign policy. You have to put this in context a little. So many New Zealand men had left this dominion in both the First and the Second World Wars to fight in what was called a world war but could have also been a European war. And they did it without really having an independent foreign policy. We were doing what our colonisers wanted. And also our own soldiers, and that included my father. So there's always been this belief afterwards, when we, when we were very instrumental in setting up the United Nations and being part of that, that we wanted at long last to have an independent voice that talked about the kind of foreign policy we wanted for our country. That act that I talked about, the New Zealand Nuclear Free Zone Disarmament and Arms Control Act, also established a ministry with its minister responsible for disarmament and arms control. And in the fifth Labour government, the next one, I hold that portfolio, along with others such as Associate Foreign Minister responsible for New Zealand aid and environment. They were a wonderful mix and you can see the things that would join up and I'll come to that later. But what sort of issues did I face under disarmament? Well, we wanted to continue building the disarmament movement amongst other nations. And our first uh, work really was around encouraging others to form nuclear free zones. The first one had been in Latin America and the Caribbean, quite a local, and that was signed and came into act in 1967, came into force. Then there was a Pacific one in the South Pacific, and it came into force in 1986, I think. Southeast Asia, uh, 1997. The African ones, Pelandaba in 2009, and the very brave one, in Central Asia in 2009. And the countries that formed that Central Asian bloc and nuclear free zone had also suffered from a larger country doing its nuclear testing in their countries with dire effects for the people of those countries. You ask me what sort of issues did I tackle in office? Well, that was the nuclear free zones. But also, we had all signed the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. Now, I don't want, just like you, I don't want other countries to acquire nuclear weapons, and sadly they have, India, Pakistan, um, and probably Israel. Uh, but I also, as a New Zealander, wanted those countries that had nuclear weapons to abide by Article 6, which they had signed, which said that they would work 
for the disarmament in their countries, they're moving away from nuclear weapons. And always the argument has been on not let's have other countries get them. The war in Iraq, the antagonism towards Iran, they're all based around non-proliferation. And yet those signatories have ignored Article 6, which is about disarmament of the weapons that they hold. So we worked for that, and the preparatory committee that meets every five years on the treaty, uh, we had that meeting in 2005, and again we focused on Article 6, but to no avail. Also worked uh, from our ministry on small arms in the Pacific, because in the Pacific, while there has been nuclear testing there, many deaths have been as a result of small arms and the availability of them, and the sale of them, the uncontrolled trading in them. And so we began some work on researching this and trying to support uh, different island states uh, in making sure that they had the wherewithal to control the use and distribution of small arms. We also tried, I have the power as a cabinet minister and as a minister for disarmament, to prevent any military weapons or aids to military weapons uh, being sold to countries that we thought were in a, that would use them uh, aggressively against others. Uh, I had a, I thought I had a success in that, but in years later I learned that I didn't uh, in trying to stop the sale to Israel of some sharp shooting uh, programs that enabled people online, or well, not online, but through computers to improve their sharpshooting. I didn't particularly uh, value where, where and how that might be used. Uh, but the, the factory in New Zealand that made them was bought out by, I think, an American company and shifted out to uh, either Southern America or Mexico. So in the end, I didn't have much success. We also worked with school children. We worked in neighbourhoods. We began where well, we built on um, peer support, uh, peer intervention, uh, peer peace monitoring in the playgrounds in our schools. We had a peer leadership scheme to try and get kids to learn that you don't have to use weapons or your fists to resolve an issue. The second question you asked me is that you said that in Britain, talking about ethical foreign policy, sometimes it's seen as naive and sentimental ethical but impractical. And you asked what responses we had towards that. I never had that response in New Zealand and the reason was simple. Rather like the Central Asian states, our nuclear free status in New Zealand originated because the major powers, the United Kingdom, the United States, France, had used the Pacific as a testing ground for their nuclear weapons. It was a French test in the 1970s that enraged New Zealanders. As we saw it, if you were so keen to have these weapons, then why on earth didn't you test them in your own backyard, on your soil? Just imagine testing it in Provence, the outrage. But instead, you sent that out to the Pacific. And then, the French bombed uh, a protest vessel, Greenpeace's Rainbow Warrior, killing a photographer or a staff member on the, uh, on the boat. The ship was tied up at our wharves in Auckland, downtown. Auckland is our largest city. And, and it was just a notion that, that, that a power could come in and say, you're so insignificant that we can come in here and, and bomb a boat, a guest of yours, and bomb it because it's annoying us. It was an awful shock, and it made straight ordinary New Zealanders, not just necessarily the political activists, but ordinary New Zealanders really angry that they had been treated with such disdain and with such disrespect for our own national beliefs. 
We have a strong sense of defending our values. The anti-nuclear legislation has been safe from all political parties. One potential Prime Minister, not sure if he ever made it to be Prime Minister now, I can't remember, uh, really came a, a, a cropper because he talked of repealing the Act, but the reaction uh, was a factor in uh, ending his political power and his political career. But listen, we're not angels, <laughs> and, and our foreign policy is not always ethical. We have the pressure to win a trade treaty. We are price takers. We survive as a nation by selling food and wood. And as such, trade is really important to us. And sometimes trade treaties have been so important that we have not lived by ethics. We went into Afghanistan for those reasons. Uh, Yes, it was meant to be a peace force, but the SAS service was certainly not peaceful. So we haven't always been as ethical as sometimes I think people think we are. We are proud, however, when our military forces go into places like East Timor or Timor-Leste or in the Solomon Islands and work with the locals and with the local government to actually build peace. That's fabulous. They tell a glorious story in Timor Leste, I think it is, um, that the food scraps in the local camp where the New Zealand army was, we saved them in a big tin and took them down to the village to the local pigs. And they had the best pigs in Timor Leste. I think the people loved and appreciated the fact um, that our, our forces and our people were so practical. Finally, I just want to say to you, it's not naive to work for an ethical foreign policy. Being a good neighbour in times of climate change is going to challenge us all. We are already seeing the effects of climate change on immigration, on the number of refugees, on starvation, on instability in political terms. We're going to need each other in these years to come. We will need to have peace in our regions and a knowledge of each other so that we can help each other effectively. And we need trust. We only get trust through ethical behaviour. That's the only way trust grows. Any former teacher knows that in a classroom. I'm not denying that nuclear weapons are still a threat, along with the other horrific, non-discriminating weapons that are being used, Syria, in, in Syria, for example. But so are the threats to us all from climate change. And so think of those three portfolios I held, New Zealand Aid, disarmament and environment. Why, oh why, do we spend so much money on weapons and defence, including the trillions that President Obama spent on defence, and so little on reducing our reliance on carbon fuels and doing our best to reduce what is going up into the atmosphere. That, I believe, is truly unethical. So people, end of sermon. Thank you for asking me. We're watching you from over here and we're hoping you and the UK Labour Party get through, become strong and uh, be good to each other because we need each other. Thank you.